Section twenty six of Volume One of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume One of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter fourteen. The Capetians to the Time of the Crusades. Part one. From 996 to 1108, the first three successors of Hugh Capet, his son Robert, his grandson Henry I, and his great-grandson Philip I, sat upon the throne of France, and during this long space of one hundred and twelve years the kingdom of France had not, sooth to say, any history. Parcelled out, by virtue of the feudal system, between a multitude of princes, independent, isolated, and scarcely sovereigns in their own dominions, keeping up anything like frequent intercourse only with their neighbours, and loosely united, by certain rules or customs of vassalage, to him amongst them who bore the title of king, the France of the eleventh century existed in little more than name. Normandy, Brittany, Burgundy, Aquitaine, Poitou, Anjou, Flanders, and Nivernais were the real states and peoples, each with its own distinct life and history. One single event, the Crusade, united, towards the end of the century, those scattered sovereigns and peoples in one common idea and one combined action. Up to that point, then, let us conform to the real state of the case, and faithfully trace out the features of the epoch, without attempting to introduce a connection and a combination which did not exist, and let us pass briefly in review of the isolated events and personages which are still worthy of remembrance, and which have remained historic without having belonged exactly to a national history. Amongst events of this kind, one, the conquest of England in 1066, by William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, was so striking and exercised so much influence over the destinies of France, that in the incoherent and disconnected picture of this eleventh century, particular attention must first be drawn to the consequences, as regarded France, of that great Norman enterprise. After the sagacious Hugh Capet, the first three Capetians, Robert, Henry I, and Philip I, were very mediocre individuals, in character as well as intellect, and their personal insignificance was one of the causes that produced the emptiness of French history under their sway. Robert lacked neither physical advantages nor moral virtues. He had a lofty figure, says his biographer Helgod, Archbishop of Bourse, hair smooth and well arranged, a modest eye, a pleasant and gentle mouth, a tolerably furnished beard, and high shoulders. He was versed in all the sciences, philosopher enough and an excellent musician, and so devoted to sacred literature that he never passed a day without reading the Psalter, and praying to the Most High God together with St. David. He composed several hymns which were adopted by the Church, and during a pilgrimage he made to Rome, he deposited upon the altar of St. Peter his own Latin poems set to music. He often went to the Church of St. Denis, clad in his royal robes and with his crown on his head, and there he conducted the singing at matins, mass, and vespers, chanting with the monks, and himself calling upon them to sing. When he sat in the consistory, he voluntarily styled himself the bishop's client. Two centuries later, St. Louis proved that the virtues of the saint are not incompatible with the qualities of the king, but the former cannot form a substitute for the latter, and the qualities of the king were to seek in Robert. He was neither warrior nor politician, there is no sign that he ever gathered about him, to discuss affairs of state, the laic barons together with the bishops, and when he interfered in the wars of the great feudal lords, notably in Burgundy and Flanders, it was with but little energy and to but little purpose. He was hardly more potent in his family than in his kingdom. It has already been mentioned that, in spite of his preceptor Gerbert's advice, he had espoused Bertha, widow of Eudes, Count of Blois, and he loved her dearly but the marriage was assailed by the church, on the ground of kinship. Robert offered resistance, but afterwards gave way before the excommunication pronounced by Pope Gregory V, and then espoused Constance, daughter of William Chelfair, Count of Toulouse, and forthwith, says the chronicler Raoul Glaber, were seen pouring into France and Burgundy, because of this queen, the most vain and most frivolous of all men, coming from Aquitaine and Auvergne. There were outlandish and outrageous equally in their manners and their dress, in their arms and the appointments of their horses, their hair came only half-way down their head, 
They shaved their beards like actors. They wore boots and shoes that were not decent, and lastly, neither fidelity nor security was to be looked for in any of their ties. Alack! That nation of Franks, which was wont to be the most virtuous, and even the people of Burgundy, too, were eager to follow these criminal examples, and before long they reflected only too faithfully the depravity and infamy of their models. The evil amounted to something graver than a disturbance of court fashions. Robert had by Constance three sons, Hugh, Henry, and Robert. First the eldest, and afterwards his two brothers, maddened by the bad character and tyrannical exactions of their mother, left the palace, and withdrew to Drux and Burgundy, abandoning themselves, in the royal domains and the neighbourhood, to all kinds of depredations and excesses. Reconciliation was not without great difficulty effected, and, indeed, peace was never really restored in the royal family. Peace was everywhere the wish and study of King Robert, but he succeeded better in maintaining it with his neighbours than with his children. In 1006 he was on the point of having a quarrel with Henry the Second, Emperor of Germany, who was more active and enterprising, but fortunately not less pious than himself. The two sovereigns resolved to have an interview at the Meuse, the boundary of their dominions. The question amongst their respective followings was, which of the two should cross the river to seek audience on the other bank, that is, in the other's dominions? This would be a humiliation, it was said. The two learned princes remembered this saying of Ecclesiasticus, The greater thou art, the humbler be thou in all things. The emperor, therefore, rose up early in the morning, and crossed, with some of his people, into the French king's territory. They embraced with cordiality, the bishops, as was proper, celebrated the sacrament of the Mass, and they afterwards sat down to dinner. When the meal was over, King Robert offered Henry immense presents of gold and silver and precious stones, and a hundred horses richly caparisoned, each carrying a cuirass and a helmet, and he added that all the emperor did not accept of these gifts would be so much deducted from their friendship. Henry, seeing the generosity of his friend, took of the whole only a book containing the holy gospel, set with gold and precious stones, and a golden amulet, wherein was a tooth of St. Vincent, priest and martyr. The empress likewise accepted only two golden cups. Next day King Robert crossed with his bishops into the territories of the emperor, who received him magnificently, and after dinner offered him a hundred pounds of pure gold. The king in his turn accepted only two golden cups, and, after having ratified their pact of friendship, they returned each to his own dominions. Let us add to this summary of Robert's reign some facts which are characteristic of the epoch. In A.D. 1000, in consequence of the sense attached to certain words in the sacred books, many Christians expected the end of the world. The time of expectation was full of anxieties, plagues, famines, and diverse accidents, which then took place in diverse quarters, were an additional aggravation. The churches were crowded, penances, offerings, absolutions, all the forms of invocation and repentance multiplied rapidly. A multitude of souls, in submission or terror, prepared to appear before their judge. And after what catastrophes? in the midst of what gloom or of what light. These were fearful questions, of which men's imaginations were exhausted in forestalling the solution. When the last day of the tenth and the first of the eleventh centuries were past, it was like a general regeneration. It might have been said that time was beginning over again, and the work was commenced of rendering the Christian world worthy of the future. Especially in Italy and Gaul, says the chronicler Raoul Glaber, men took in hand the reconstruction of the basilicas, although the greater part had no need thereof. Christian people seemed to vie one with another which should erect the most beautiful. It was as if the world, shaking itself together and casting off its old garments, would have decked itself with the white robes of Christ. Christian art, in its earliest form of the Gothic style, dates from this epoch. The power and riches of the Christian Church, in its different institutions, received at this crisis of the human imagination a fresh impulse. Other facts, some lamentable and some salutary, began about this epoch, to assume in French history a place which was destined before long to become an important one. Piles of faggots were set up, first at Orléans and then at Toulouse, for the punishment of heretics. The heretics of the day were Manichaeans. King Robert and Queen Constance sanctioned by their presence this return to human sacrifices offered to God, as a penalty inflicted on mental offenders against his word. At the same time a double portion of ire blazed forth against the Jews. 
"'What have we to do,' it was said, "'with going abroad to make war on Mussulmans? "'Have we not in the very midst of us "'the greatest enemies of Jesus Christ?' Amongst Christians, acts of oppression and violence on the part of the great against the small became so excessive and so frequent, that they excited in country parts, particularly in Normandy, insurrections which the insurgents tried to organize into permanent resistance. In several counties of Normandy, says William of Jumieg, all the peasants, meeting in conventicles, resolved to live according to their own wills and their own laws, not only in the heart of the forests, but also on the borders of the rivers, and without care for any established rights. To accomplish this design, these mobs of madmen elected each two deputies, who were to form, at the central point, an assembly charged with the execution of their decrees. So soon as the Duke, Richard the Second, was informed thereof, he sent a large body of armed men to suppress this audacity in the country parts, and to disperse this rustic assembly. In execution of his orders, the deputies of the peasantry and many other rebels were forthwith arrested, their feet and hands were cut off, and they were sent home thus mutilated to deter their fellows from such enterprises, and to render them more prudent for fear of worse. After this experience, the peasants gave up their meetings and returned to their ploughs. This is a literal translation of the monkish chronicler, who was far from favourable to the insurgent peasants, and was more for applauding the suppression than justifying the insurrection. The suppression, though undoubtedly effectual for the moment, and in the particular spots it reached, produced no general or lasting effect. About a century after the cold recital of William Jemegg, a poet chronicler, Robert Wace, in his Romance of Rue, a history in verse of Rollo and the first dukes of Normandy, related the same facts with far more sympathetic feeling and poetical colouring. The lords do us not but ill, he makes the Norman peasants say. With them we have nor gain nor profit from our labours. Every day is for us a day of suffering, toil, and weariness. Every day we have our cattle taken from us for road-work and forced service. We have plaints and grievances, old and new exactions, pleas and processes without end. Money please, market please, road please, forest please, mill please, blackmail please, watch and ward please. There are so many provosts, bailiffs, and sergeants, that we have not one hour's peace. Day by day they ruin us down, seize our movables, and drive us from our lands. There is no security for us against the lords, and no pact is binding with them. Why suffer all this evil to be done to us, and not get out of our plight? Are we not men even as they are? Have we not the same stature, the same limbs, the same strength for suffering? All we need is courage. Let us, then, bind ourselves together by an oath. Let us swear to support one another, and if they will make war on us, have we not, for one night, thirty or forty young peasants, nimble and ready to fight with club, with boar-spear, with arrow, with axe, and even with stones if they have not weapons? Let us learn to resist the knights, and we shall be free to cut down trees, to hunt and fish after our fashion, and we shall work our will in flood and field and wood. Here we have no longer the short account and severe estimate of an indifferent spectator. It is the cry of popular rage and vengeance reproduced by the lively imagination of an angered poet. Undoubtedly, the Norman peasants of the twelfth century did not speak of their miseries with such descriptive ability and philosophical feeling as were lent to them by Robert Wace. They did not meditate the democratic revolution, of which he attributes to them the idea and almost the plan, but the deeds of violence and oppression against which they rose were very real and they exerted themselves to escape by reciprocal violence from intolerable suffering. Thence date those alternations of demagogic revolt and tyrannical suppression which have so often ensanguined the land, and put in peril the very foundations of social order. Insurrections became of so atrocious a kind that the atrocious chastisements with which they were visited seemed equally natural and necessary. It needed long ages, a repetition of civil wars and terrible political shocks, to put an end to this brutal chaos which gave birth to so many evils and reciprocal crimes, and to bring about, amongst the different classes of the French population, equitable and truly human relations. So quick-spreading and contagious is evil amongst men, and so difficult to extirpate in the name of justice and truth. However, even in the midst of this cruel egotism and this gross unreason of the tenth and eleventh centuries, the necessity, from a moral and social point of view, of struggling against such disgusting irregularities, made itself felt, found zealous advocates. 
From this epoch are to be dated the first efforts to establish, in different parts of France, what was called God's peace, God's truce. The words were well chosen for prohibiting at the same time oppression and revolt, for it needed nothing less than law and the voice of God to put some restraint upon the barbarous manners and passions of men, great or small, lord or peasant. It is the peculiar and glorious characteristic of Christianity to have so well understood the primitive and permanent evil in human nature, that it fought against all the great iniquities of mankind, and exposed them in principle, even when, in point of general practice, it neither hoped nor attempted to sweep them away. Bishops, priests, and monks were, in their personal lives and in the councils of the Church, the first propagators of God's peace or truce, and in more than one locality they induced the laic lords to follow their lead. In 1164, Hugh II, Count of Rodez, in concert with his brother Hugh, Bishop of Rodez, and the notables of the district, established the peace in the diocese of Rodez. And this it is, said the learned Benedictines of the eighteenth century, in the art of verifying dates, which gave rise to the toll of commune paix, or pesade, which is still collected in Rugur. King Robert always showed himself favorable to this pacific work, and he is the first among the five kings of France, in other respects very different, himself, St. Louis, Louis the Twelfth, Henry the Fourth, and Louis the Sixteenth, who were particularly distinguished for sympathetic kindness and anxiety for the popular welfare. Robert had a kindly feeling for the weak and poor. Not only did he protect them, on occasion, against the powerful, but he took pains to conceal their defaults, and in his church and at his table he suffered himself to be robbed without complaint, that he might not have to denounce and punish the robbers. Wherefore, at his death, says his biographer, Helgod, there were great mourning and intolerable grief. A countless number of widows and orphans sorrowed for the many benefits received from him. They did beat their breasts, and went to and from his tomb, crying, Whilst Robert was king and ordered all, we lived in peace. We had naught to fear. May the soul of that pious father, that father of the senate, that father of all good, be blessed and saved. May it mount up and dwell for ever with Jesus Christ, the King of kings. Though not so pious nor so good as Robert, his son Henry I and his grandson Philip I were neither more energetic nor more glorious kings. During their long reigns, the former from 1031 to 1060, and the latter from 1060 to 1108, no important and well-prosecuted design distinguished their government. Their public life was passed at one time in petty warfare, without decisive results, against such and such vassals, at another in acts of capricious intervention in the quarrels of their vassals amongst themselves. Their home life was neither less irregular nor conducted with more wisdom and regard for the public interest. King Robert had not succeeded in keeping his first wife, Bertha of Burgundy, and his second, Constance of Aquitaine, with her imperious, malevolent, avaricious, meddlesome disposition, reduced him to so abject a state that he never gave a gratuity to any of his servants without saying, Take care that Constance know not of it. After Robert's death, Constance, having become regent for her eldest son, Henry I, forthwith conspired to dethrone him, and to put in his place her second son, Robert, who was her favourite. Henry, on being delivered by his mother's death from her tyranny and intrigues, was thrice married, but his first two marriages with two German princesses, one the daughter of the Emperor Conrad the Salic, the other of the Emperor Henry III, were so far from happy that in 1051 he sent into Russia, to Kiev, in search of his third wife, Anne, the daughter of Tsar Yaroslav the Halt. She was a modest creature who lived quietly up to the death of her husband in 1060, and two years afterward, in the reign of her son Philip I, rather than return to her own country, married Raoul, Count of Valois, who put away to marry her, his second wife, Hockney, called Eleanor. The divorce was opposed at Rome before Pope Alexander III, to whom the Archbishop of Rheims wrote upon the subject, Our kingdom is the scene of great troubles. The Queen Mother has espoused Count Raoul, which has mightily displeased the King. As for the lady whom Raoul has put away, we have recognized the justice of the complaints she has preferred before you, and the falsity of the pretext on which he put her away. The Pope ordered the Count to take back his wife. Raoul would not obey and was excommunicated, but he made light of it and the Princess Anne of Russia, actually reconciled, apparently, to Philip I, lived tranquilly in France, where, in 1075, shortly after the death of her second husband, Count Raoul, her signature was still attached to a charter side by side with that of the king, her son. 
The marriages of Philip I brought even more trouble and scandal than those of his father and grandfather. At nineteen years of age, in 1072, he had espoused Bertha, daughter of Florent I, Count of Holland, and in 1078 he had by her the son who was destined to succeed him with the title of Louis the Fat. But twenty years later, 1092, Philip took a dislike to his wife, put her away, and banished her to montreuil sur mer on the ground of prohibited consanguinity. He had conceived, there is no knowing when, a violent passion for a woman celebrated for her beauty, Bertrand, the fourth wife, for three years past, of Fouque de Rouen, the brawler, Count of Anjou. Philip, having thus packed off Bertha, sent out for Tours, where Bertrand happened to be with her husband. There, in the church of St. John, during the benediction of the baptismal fonts, they entered into mutual engagements. Philip went away again, and a few days afterwards Bertrand was carried off by some people he had left in the neighbourhood of Tours, and joined him at Orléans. Nearly all the bishops of France, and amongst others the most learned and respected of them, Yves, Bishop of Chartres, refused their benediction to this shocking marriage, and the king had great difficulty in finding a priest to render him that service. Then commenced between Philip and the heads of the Catholic Church, popes and bishops, a struggle which, with negotiation upon negotiation, and excommunication upon excommunication, lasted twelve years, without the king's being able to get his marriage canonically recognized, and though he promised to send away Bertrade, he was not content with merely keeping her with him, but he openly jeered at excommunication and interdicts. It was the custom, says William of Malmesbury, at the places where the king sojourned, for divine service to be stopped, and as soon as he was moving away, all the bells began to peal. And then Philip would cry, as he laughed like one beside himself, "'Dost hear, my love, how they are ringing us out?' At last, in 1104, the bishop of Chartres himself, wearied by the persistency of the king and by sight of the trouble in which the prolongation of the interdict was plunging the kingdom, wrote to the Pope, Pascal II, I do not presume to offer you advice. I only desire to warn you that it were well to show for a while some condescension towards the weaknesses of the man, so far as consideration for his salvation may permit, and to rescue the country from the critical state to which it is reduced by the excommunication of this prince." The Pope consequently sent instructions to the bishops of the realm, and they, at the king's summons, met at Paris on the 1st of December, 1104. One of them, Lambert, bishop of Arras, wrote to the Pope, We sent as a deputation to the king the bishops of John of Orléans and Galon of Paris, charged to demand of him whether he would conform to the clauses and conditions set forth in your letters, and whether he were determined to give up the unlawful intercourse which had made him guilty before God the king having answered, without being disconcerted, that he was ready to make atonement to God and the Holy Roman Church, was introduced to the assembly. He came barefooted, in a posture of devotion and humility, confessing his sin and promising to purge him of this excommunication by expiatory deeds. And thus, by your authority, he earned absolution. Then, laying his hands on the book of the Holy Gospels, he took an oath, in the following terms, to renounce his guilty and unlawful marriage. Hearken, thou Lambert, Bishop of Arras, who are here in place of the apostolic pontiff, and let the archbishops and bishops here present hearken unto me. I, Philip, king of the French, do promise not to go back to my sin, and to break off wholly with the criminal intercourse I have heretofore kept up with Bertrade. I do promise that henceforth I will have with her no intercourse or companionship, save in the presence of persons beyond suspicion. I will observe, faithfully and without turning aside, these promises, in the sense set forth in the letters of the Pope, and as ye understand, so help me God and by these holy gospels. Bertrade, at the moment of her release from excommunication, took in person the same oath on the holy gospels. According to the statement of the learned Benedictines who studiously examined into this incident, it is doubtful whether Philip I broke off all intercourse with Bertrade. Two years after his absolution, on the 10th of October, 1106, he arrived at Angers on a Wednesday, says a contemporary chronicler, accompanied by the queen named Bertrade, and was there received by Count Fuchs and all the Angevines, cleric and laic, with great honours. The day after his arrival, on Thursday, the monks of St. Nicholas, introduced by the queen, presented themselves before the queen, and humbly prayed him, in concert with the queen, to countenance, for the salvation of his soul and of the queen, and his relatives and friends, all acquisitions made by them in his dominions, or that they might hereafter make, by gift or purchase, 
and to be pleased to place his seal on their titles to the property. And the king granted their request. End of chapter 14, part 1